started last week on the angels and their authority. We did not get to finish. So we're going to take up where we left off. And we left off actually on number six talking about uh, common angels. Um, I'll say just one thing. Why you said they were made of God and star. Yeah. Well, the person that uh, our mission has been benefiting uh, for the last four years to go to school, she prayed away the last four years. So she got her degree. And, and that's a, a major goal, a major milestone for a young girl to graduate in the least. So thank you all very much. Okay, we're going to be covering the second half of our uh, lesson on angels and their levels of responsibility. We covered all the way up to number five. We're going to start with number six. One of the things that the Lord actually added uh, for tonight that's not on your handout, there's a couple of verses, because it's amazing as we've been studying about angels, he began to show me some things pertaining to angelic beings and the mystery of God. And so I was really pumped about that. And uh, I want to make sure we cover that tonight because that will be at the end of this particular lesson. So let's start out talking about uh, common angels. I you know it's kind of a sad phrase to even say common angels because when you think about it, they're not common but these are the angels that I would call, you know, once again, the foot soldiers are the ones uh, that may not necessarily be in high ranking, but yet even one angel that we would just call maybe, a, I'll call it a foot soldier type angel, uh, has great authority, great power that God has bestowed upon them and God uses them. And they, I mean, when we think about it, like when we study Revelations, but, you know, when Satan gets thrown to the bottom of the pit, it's only going to be one angel that does it. So when you think about that, even one angel can over, you know, can uh, overtake uh, Satan and his forces when it's time to, you know, throw them in the bottom of the pit. But we're going to start out in Acts chapter 5, starting in verses 17 and 20, talking about an, an angelic being. And it says, Then the high priest took action. He and all who were with him, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, being filled with jealousy, arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. Alright, first of all, I have it underlined during the night in Angel of the Lord. When you see this, do you where do you what do you believe that particular angel is? Do you believe it's a, a symbolic of Jesus or just an angel? Just an angel. And why? Because it's not capitalized. Correct. Which is what we talked about last week. When you see, especially predominantly in the Old Testament, where it's Angel of the Lord, but it's a capital A. That right there, when you study it, you're going to find that that is representative of Jesus himself. Because remember, the Old Testament, Jesus is concealed, but the New Testament, he's revealed. So you may not see the name Jesus in the Old Testament, but he is going to be referred to as different names. One of them being capital A, Angel of the Lord. And you'll notice that as we studied last week where the angel of the Lord, capital A, was talking. He talked in first person as covenant with me, a covenant I made, which only the Lord can do that. So in this particular case, because it's a little A, it's just talking about one of the angels of the Lord. Now, one thing I want to point out, this is just FYI, and some of you may not be aware of it. When it says that the high priest, and it says all who were with him, that is the sect of the Sadducees. Now, when you're studying in the New Testament, you're going to find there are Pharisees and there are Sadducees. Does anybody offhand know the difference between the two? One believed in resurrection, the other yeah. was not. Correct. One believed in resurrection, the other one did not. One believed in angelic beings, the other one did not. How can you tell the difference? This is what I learned that's so easy for me to remember. When you think about Sadducees, think about, oh, that's sad, you see. <laughs> <laughs> that they don't believe in resurrection. The 
see, that's a good way to remember it. The Sadducees were the sect that did not believe in the resurrection or angelic beings. So when you, when you even see Jesus, when he was confronting the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you can understand, you know, the Sadducees, if you were to start really breaking it down in the Gospels and say, you know what, I'm just going to study Jesus' interaction with the Sadducees, you're going to probably find out that is probably going to be coming up, him talking about him being resurrected and why they were so against it because they didn't believe in it. All right, and that was just a little side note there. So, they, the uh, disciples, they were arrested, the apostles, put them in the public prison. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out, and said, once again, go stand in the temple, tell the people the whole message about this life. So, as it goes on uh, in verse uh, 32, you know, the scripture says where they declare we ought to obey God rather than men because they were told, look, we're going to let you go, but don't go preaching Jesus anymore in the streets. And so what did the apostles say? It's better to obey God than men. And God's saying we need to preach it even though they were telling them don't do it. So the Lord sent an angel. And in this case, would you just assume this particular angel was just a messenger? He wasn't there to do battle. He wasn't there, you know, battling the powers and the principalities and the demonic forces. He was just there to release the open door and give them a message on what they were to do. So that was his particular, um, if I can use this phrase, that was his job. That was his purpose. All right. Now. In Acts 10, verses 3 and 4, there's also a reference to an angel, and it says, about the ninth hour of the day. Does anybody know what time of the day that would be? Like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour, if I'm not mistaken. Great. Because no. uh, I'm talking about like when Jesus was on the cross and he talked about the ninth hour. All right, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, of course, who is this talking about? Who's, who was in this interaction? It was Peter, correct? Mm -hmm. And say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Well, this angel came to um, Cornelius, and this was when there was the situation going on where uh, the Lord sends Peter to Cornelius to give them the message. But the angel of God, though, went to Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was not even a Jew. But he said, and he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. This particular angel came to Cornelius just to let him know God has been hearing your prayers. And your version may not say alms. Your may say giving or charity or whatever. Cornelius was a very, very giving person. And isn't it interesting that God, God acknowledged him as a giver. He acknowledged him that he was, was lifting up his prayer petitions to the Lord, but also the fact that he was such a giver. And that obviously moved the Lord to the point of him saying, you know what? I'm coming to give you a message from the Lord. But he said, your prayers and your giving, your alms, have ascended as a memorial before God. Does anybody's version say anything different if you have it open? As far as your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, he let us. Prayers and gifts of the poor have been received by God as an offering. Okay, that's good. Did everybody hear that? <coughs> your prayers and gifts of the poor have been received by God as an offering. Wow. Isn't that something to know that if we give to the poor that's received by the Lord as an offering. Um, it's 
really interesting, but yet it moved God enough about Cornelius to send an angel to him to tell him that. And then, of course, Philip comes. But in Acts chapter 8, here's a situation where Philip is being told to go minister to a eunuch. All right, so in Acts 8, 26 to 27, it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, said, Now, when I was doing some studies on angels, you know, and breaking down, you know, their, their, their characteristics and all of that, personalities and all of that, you know, one of the things that people may not even think about is the fact of what they say and it says that they spoke and so they have voice they have mouths they speak they can they can talk and that's just one characteristic but an angel of the lord spoke to philip saying arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from jerusalem to gaza this is desert now, I'm going to stop right there for a second because you'll notice how specific this angel was in giving instructions to Philip. Now, what does that mean for you and I as believers? There's sometimes when the Lord is going to be very general in what he tells you. There's going to be some times where the Lord wants to be very, very specific with you, especially if it's a divine appointment. Anybody ever experienced that? You know, when all of a sudden the Lord says, I want you to go to Walmart. I want you to go to Food Land. I want you to go get your clothes out of the dry cleaners like right now <laughs> or today. And you're wondering, well, why am I needing to do that today? You just have to follow that voice. And in this particular case, he's telling Philip very uh, specific instructions. First of all, Arise. In other words, get up from where you're going or where you're at. Get up. Go towards the south. He even says along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. He told him what direction to go in, what road to go in. That's why even sometimes I'm thinking, why am I going to Walmart down Main Street instead of the parkway? Or why am I going down the parkway instead of Main Street? Go with it. Because something may be coming up where the Lord's wanting you to pull into a different place. All right, so 27, it says, So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Well, first of all, he wasn't even a Jew, right? A man of Ethiopia, now he could have been an Ethiopian Jew, but it does not say that. A eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. So that pretty much tells you he's pretty much going to be a Gentile uh, because they, the Jews did not have Candace as their queen. But it said, who had charge of all her treasure? Why did the Lord even have to say that? I don't know. But it's amazing how sometimes the Lord will be so specific in his word to make note that, first of all, this eunuch, being a Gentile from Ethiopia, was a man of great authority. He worked and submitted to Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. And he also happened to be one who was in charge of all of her treasury. Why? I don't know. Did the Lord choose him? Maybe he had been asking the Lord. I know he uh, was coming to Jerusalem to worship, so maybe he had had an encounter with the Lord. Maybe he was seeking and desiring to know the God of the Jews. I really don't know. But I do know that he was going to Jerusalem to worship. There had to be something going on that he may have been crying out to the Lord, saying, I need to know you. I want to know you. I want to know who this God is. Because for him to leave Ethiopia and go all the way to Jerusalem says a lot. And he could have heard about Jesus and was Sure, he could have been. You're right. He could have been. He could have heard about Jesus. He could have heard about this Messiah, this prophet. He could have, and he wanted to find out for himself. 
You're, li you're eliminating the Lord. And then you're now looking to the angels for your protection or guide or provision or whatever instead of the Lord. So that makes perfect sense. All right, so going back then, now Psalms 91, of course, makes much more sense. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So it's important that God does the commanding of his angels to guard you and I. All right, and then Psalms 34, 7 also says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. So how many of us in this room fear the Lord? Okay. Then what does that tell you? That an angel is encamped around you to watch over you and they listen to the voice of the Lord. That's why prayer is extremely important. Because when you pray and you, and you release your petitions and your requests and your prayers and your intercession to the Lord, you're giving him something to work with then to turn around and command his angels. Now that doesn't mean God can't do it on his own. But you understand because of the free will and everything going on this earth that he gives mankind. When we release our petitions to the Lord, like he says in Revelation, the prayers of the saints are forever before his throne at his altar. We're giving God something to, to work with, if you'll allow me to use that phrase, where then he can dispatch his angelic host to do what needs to be done. But here's what I see different about Psalm 34, 7 is there's something that's expected of you and I. Does that, does that look pretty clear? Everybody see that in that bottom verse? Anybody can see what it is? Those who fear him. Those who fear him. Those who reverence the Lord. Those who honor the Lord. And obviously that would include those who obey the Lord. The angels of the Lord encamp themselves around them. Who fear him. Now we all know it talks about it in Luke about how you know there are, that the angels are, you know are before God's throne and it talks about the little children and, and how not to harm the little children. It says it's better you have that millstone around your neck than to harm a child because it talks about their angels are before God's throne. Every one of us as a child of God does have, according to that scripture, an angel that is watching over us and guarding us. But I see this when it says in camps around those tells me some pretty severe covering and protection. That they are aware because it also says what? And delivers them. Delivers them. If you fear the Lord, if you reverence Him and obey Him and honor Him and worship Him, He's going to deliver you whatever could be going on in your life or, or for those you love. Amen. Amen. Okay. My dad this time was sick. And I got a phone call. He needed to come. I said, my dad was going to take through it. So she called back. It's fine. I was going to wait for three or four days and enjoy my time off. So he could listen to work. Anyways, I've never been fearful before, but during that I got so uneasy about making that trip. I've never done that before. So I told Uncle Billy, he's a prayer warrior. He and I began to pray. And, and when, when that stayed with me the whole time, I was constantly in prayer. Dad got worse to the next morning. And on the way up there, we ran into a blizzard. And by the time I got to the other side of Columbus, Ohio, we went back to Cleveland, there were semi trucks. Everybody was all there. I'm serious. It was that bad. And we, we didn't stop because we had to get there. And all of a sudden, I mean, the whole time this trip, I'm praying because I had to stop. All of a sudden, these two semis and had come. And we were right there. And all of a sudden, they were coming toward us because they, they were jackknifing at us. And he immediately went like that. And Jerry told me afterward, he said, I couldn't touch my steering wheel. It went its own way. And, and I'm telling you, we went through that thing. As soon as we got past them, it's like it went like this real quick. We got through them, and then they hit. And I knew then, as soon as that happened, if I had stayed in prayer, 
we would need help. Seriously. I lay down on my chair and I went to my seat and went to sleep. I didn't care if that fight, but it's no like God had it. Because that, that left me, that heaviness, that fearfulness, that what do you want to call it, it left me. Because I saw what I saw, and we were surrounded behind us on both sides with these semis. And Jerry said he couldn't even touch his legs, he couldn't do anything. It's as if something else. And it started when I had a We were riding through, and it was just amazing. It was awesome. I, I want to share real quick about something that happened to me because we are we were talking about guardian angels and ministering angels we're going to talk about. When I was in Texas, when I was uh, in my secular job, I was a VP in banking, and I was on a business trip, and this is when, you know, Pastor Keith and I had already gone through leadership at Cornerstone. We were involved, very involved in the church and growing in the Lord, and, and we had just started getting involved in the uh, Deliverance ministry, which involved a lot of warfare and so forth. Uh, I had to go on a business trip, and for some reason I felt very um, uneasy. It wasn't that I was fearful or anything like that. I just had this quickening in my spirit. And I get on the airplane, and I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting, uh, you know, for the other people to get on the airplane. And the next thing I know, this woman that probably... Uh, maybe she was maybe in her 50s, 60s, came onto the plane and looked at me and she literally growled, okay? And I already understood about warfare and demonic spirits and all that. So I already knew my spirit was quickened when I heard the growl. And she looked at me and I could see the demon coming out of her eyes and she began to growl and she came and sat right behind me. And I thought, you know, so we're, you know, we take off and we're in the air, and the next thing you know, this woman that was growling at me begins to grab hold of my seat, and she's doing this to my seat, and I knew what was going on, because the Holy Spirit already began to reveal to me what was going on, and I turned around and looked at her, and I just went, I rebuke you in Jesus' name, and I turned back around. And, of course, she ordered alcohol, and she was drinking alcohol, and so she began to lean forward where she was right behind my seat. You know, there's that little gap between the seats, and she's growling at me, and she's saying things that I know is a demonic voice, and I don't understand the words and all of that. And I just continue to go, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I would then go on, actually, I was reading my Bible, uh, I had the, the thing down, and I was reading my Bible and studying. And so this went on for the whole flight. And I, I proceeded to move over to another seat because in my row I was all by myself. And I was by the window, she was by the window. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to get up. I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to move to the aisle. And um, guess what? She got up and went to the aisle right behind me. And so this is going on through the flight. And I cried out, you know, I cried out not because I was fearful, I was really kind of righteous indignation that creeped up in me. But I and I said, Lord, you are my protector, you are my high tower, you are my fortress, you are my defender. And I don't know what's happening here, whether it's a test, whether I'm going, you're teaching me to trust you, and so I do trust you, but I ask Father God that your warrior angels will, would um, help me in this particular situation that, you know, that I can be an overcomer with you, with you, Lord. So when the plane lands or whatever, you know, everybody stands up in the aisle, and I thought, I'll just get ahead of her and move on. That woman literally would push people out of, she pushed people that got between us out of the way so she could be right behind me. And the whole time, was this, she was leaning in, and the voice was like, you know, very manual kind of baritone voice. And I I just kept saying, you know, I plead the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you are my protector. And, and I said, no weapon for him against me. And I'm hoping all this is I'm standing there. And I just said, Lord, I know that you are with me. And so when I got off the plane and I'm going up the ramp, out of the blue comes this woman 
And I mean, she came out, didn't have any luggage or anything, came up right beside me and she said, are you going to baggage claim? I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. She says, I'm going to walk with you. And I said, okay. All of a sudden, there's this peace that came over me. And that woman was right behind me, that was the brower, and she was, I mean, she just tried to keep up with me. And that woman began to talk to me, and she actually started talking about the Lord. But it's interesting because she would always call him like God Almighty. She called him Sovereignty. She had different names for him. And so we were talking, and we finally got to baggage claim, and she stood right there with me. She never got luggage off the baggage claim belt thing. Never did. But she stood right there with me. And the woman that was that was harassing me got her luggage and went and came over there to where I was. And I I went and I'm heading out the door and I told her, I said, well, it was nice talking to you and, you know, I'm going to go um, because I was catching a, a, a shuttle to go to the hotel. And so she says, I'm going to walk out with you. I said, okay. So she walks out with me and here's Browder still behind me. <laughs> And, and I'm coming out to the sidewalk, and you know, then I'm waiting for the shuttle, and she just stands right there, never had a bag of luggage, nothing, no purse, no nothing. And I'm standing there with her, and she just stands there, and she's idle talking, and then next thing you know, my shuttle pulls up. I said, oh, well, this is my shuttle to the hotel. Once again, it was nice talking to you. She said, okay, and she stood there, and the growler was over here, and as I got onto the shuttle, I went and sat down, and, and here's the window, and I see her, and she stands there like this, and she's standing kind of at attention, standing there like this, and I'm fixing to ride off, and I waved at her, and she waved back at me, and when she waved back at me, she disappeared. And she disappeared. And I realized at that moment the Lord was teaching me and showing me that you never know about, you know, when it talks about entertaining strangers because you could be entertaining an angel. But I realized as the Holy Spirit was teaching me that was the encounter I just had. So I'm saying all of that to say this is that sometimes you may wonder, well, the nicest person came and sat at me with me in the waiting room. Or the nicest person came and was talking to me or, you know, was doing this or that. And you never really know, is that somebody God sent to you? And I just wanted to share that. I, I haven't been able to talk about that until this now. All right. Ministering spirits. First Kings 19, 5 through 7 says, He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold... There was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. This was the prophet they were talking about. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. Anybody know who we're talking to? We're talking about Elijah. Yes. All right. So Elijah was laying down there asleep under the tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and said to him, Arise and eat. All right. That was the instructions. The angel said, Get up and eat. And there he found there was the bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. What does that say to you and I? Always know what? That God's going to provide for you. He will provide for you. Can you imagine an angel that provided food and took something to drink? But it says he ate and drank and laid down again. Well, that's not what the Lord wanted, right? How many times has the Lord provided for us and the next thing you know we already forgot about it and laid back down and like, you know, I don't know. Anybody been there or is it just me? <laughs> yes. We cry out to the Lord for something 
You know, and he kind of texts us like, all right, now get up. No more party for one. Pity party, get up. And he strengthens us, which hopefully, instead of the bread cake on hot stones, he's like, get up and go read your word. Eat the bread of life. Drink the living water. Let it awaken you. Let it revive you. Let it strengthen you. Okay. And we go do that. Then we go back to like, oh, the Lord. <laughs> the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, all right, that's enough of this. Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. In other words, she's saying, you know, the angel was saying, what? Well, there's much for the Lord that the Lord has for you to do and you need to be ready, you need to be nourished. For us spiritually, we need to be spiritually fed, spiritually nourished with the bread of life and the living water because he's got something for us to do. And that was the purpose of the angel was to just get him up out of his woe is me and to waken him back up again. And every once in a while we need that. All right, so who do angels serve? According to Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who inherit salvation? What is this verse saying to you and I? Or verse says, saying to you and I, Because we are of need mm -hmm. when, when he feels like we need some assistance of some sort. Right. They've been sent forth to minister to what? You and I who are the inheritance of salvation. But you notice, what is he basically saying? Angels are not a part of that redemption plan. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus came for mankind to be redeemed. <coughs> He said, well, which of the angels did he ever say that to? Sit at my right hand. Are they not all ministering spirits? Ministering spirits to who? You and I. You and I. We are the inheritance of the Lord. <coughs> we are his. They are doing his command to minister to you and I. Now, it would be easy as a Christian to almost all get a big head and say, you know what? They got to take care of me. But it's a blessing. It's a privilege. Being a child of God, being a son and daughter of the Most High God comes with kingdom privilege. And that kingdom privilege, as we serve Him, as we obey Him, as we, as we honor Him, then the Lord is going to have His angels minister to us to take care of us because we are to inherit salvation through the redemption plan. Okay? And then, of course, remember we just mentioned that about Hebrews 13 too. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. And we probably have a lot of stories where we feel that's happened. Where maybe the Lord put a, a homeless person in front of you or somebody who needed to go to the doctor or somebody who needed food or whatever. And could it possibly be that the Lord was just wanting you to fulfill that action of giving or, or, or being hospitable and loving and kind? All right. I want to get to the, what the Lord showed me. Um, in Genesis 18, 1 through 3, this is when Abraham had the encounter with the Lord. Verse 1, now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of memory while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, Please do not pass your servant by. All right. He saw three men coming to him when he was sitting at the tent door when Abraham was there. 
Who were those three men? Jesus was one of them. The other two were angels. It doesn't uh, say specifically their names, but one was the Lord, the other two were angelic beings. Um, it could have been, but they were angelic beings that were standing opposite him when he saw them. So the Lord came to him, and we all know what happened after that. He fed them, and of course, then he tells them what he's going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's like, Lord, please no. You know, if there's even 50 righteous, will you not do it? And so forth. All right, avenging angels. In Genesis 19.1, here we are talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, now the two angels, because those are the ones that we believe could have been the ones with Jesus, because they went on. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Now, in verses 12 and 13, it says, Meanwhile, the angels, angels questioned Lot, Do you have any other relatives here in the city? And they asked, Get them out of this place, your sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone else, for we are about to destroy this city completely. The outcry against this place is so great, it has reached the Lord, and he has sent us to destroy it. So those two angels were what? They were avenging angels. They were sent not only to give a message to Lot to save the family, but then they were letting him know they were about to destroy the city. All right, there's death angels. Exodus 12, 23. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. So some people may think, but it's a death angel. They still have to obey the voice of the Lord. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. God has authority over even a death angel and can command them to do such. And that's exactly what happened. But he also told the uh, Israelites what they could do uh, to pass over uh, the death or the death angel to pass over their home. Okay. This is on your handouts on the back page. Just talking about angels. They're created beings. They're spiritual beings, they're immortal, they're holy, they're innumerable, they're wise, they have wise functions, they're powerful, they're the elect, they're meek, they're obedient, they possess emotions, concerned in human things, incarnate in human forms at times, you know, because it talks about how they can take the shape and form of a, you know, of a man. Uh, they're not perfect, because only who's perfect? The Lord, because remember, even what, a third of the angels fell. Uh, different jobs they have, they're invisible, and they're sexless, because it talks about they're neither male nor female. Alright, they're also ministering spirits toward believers. They are there to guide, to provide for, protect, deliver, gather, direct activities, comfort, minister to each and every one of us. All right, ministering spirits in Christ's life while here on earth. What did they do while Jesus Christ was here on earth? Number one, they announced his conception, heralded his birth. They sustained him. The scripture talks about when, when after the uh, 40 days in the wilderness, it said the angels came and ministered to him. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane, what did it say? The angel came and ministered to him. They were his witness of his resurrection. They proclaimed his resurrection. And they accompanied him to heaven at the time he ascended. This is what I want to get to, though. I was really kind of blown away about this one, and if you'll allow me here. That when the Lord took me to Ephesians 3, 10, and 11, I said, Lord, you've got to help me understand what are you saying here? The 
that angels are being taught about the redemption plan because guess what? They didn't know it. They didn't. It was a mystery to them. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. His intent was that now, through the church, who's the church? You know, every one of us in this room. So he's talking about us. His intent was that now, through you and I, the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the unseen rulers and authorities where? In the heavenly realms. Okay? In the heavenly realms. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. I said, Lord, what are you saying? The mystery of God he kept. That even the angels didn't know about the redemption plan. In the next scripture, it even talks about the angels are like, you know, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, like, what do you see in these people? What is the purpose of these people? They, they, they sin against you. They turn their backs on you. And let me show you the verse I'm talking about. But, but think about this. He said now. His intent was that now for you and I. What does he say? You and I actually are showing the angelic host about his redemption plan. About his love for you and I. God gave and um, kept that mystery until now when the church was born. They are now seeing the church with the Holy Spirit within the church. Us as the, as the temple that houses the Holy Spirit according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. He said the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to them. They didn't know the whole plan. Okay? Now, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12 says this. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Look what the last thing says. Things which angels desire to look into. They didn't know. They obeyed the Lord, but he didn't fill them in on the redemption plan. Yes, they would have heard the prophetic words that came forth through the prophets, but they didn't know the whole redemption plan. It says that through us as the church, we're making known even to the angelic realm why God even created us and what the purpose was, why Jesus had to come to earth, why he had to become a man, why he had to die on the cross, about the redemption plan. The angels are just now here about it too. And they aren't being, it isn't being fulfilled and laid out and revealed to them until the church was established. Possibly. Yeah, because the scripture says she was talking about the third the angels falling, that maybe God kept it from them because of the fallen angels. But remember, there's a scripture, and I don't know exactly where it is, but it said if Satan would have known, he would not have crucified. I was thinking about the fallen angels, the angels that had fallen, could they be persuaded? That's what kept coming to my mind when I read that scripture. Yeah, I don't know. It is. 
but things which angels desire to look into. Wow. Okay. Revelations 10, 7. This is what, this isn't in your handout. These left, I don't think these verses are. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be what? Finished. As he has declared to his servants the prophets. And you know, when the Lord took me to that verse, I was like, Lord, you know, we studied Revelation, but it never really stood out until he showed me those two previous verses. But when you think about it, like, like the scripture said, that if Satan would have known what would have happened, he would not have crucified Jesus. He didn't know about it. He was trying to destroy Jesus, but he didn't know the whole plan. But when you think about it, when man fell, Satan was always trying to thwart mankind because he had obviously saw that God created mankind in the garden. There had to been some reason and purpose for it. So when man fell, when Adam fell, Satan was always trying to come up with a counter. Okay? When Adam fell, Seth was born. How did Satan, how did Satan try to come against it? With Cain who killed his brother. When, you know, when another one was born, Satan would try to raise somebody up. When the Israelites were taken captive, you, you know, here's Pharaoh, leaves Pharaoh to, to try to destroy the Israelites. And we could go on and on and on in the Old Testament how Satan would always try. God would raise up a leader. He would raise up one of his, you know, one of those in his leadership and those that would show that he had favor with and all of that. He would always, when he raised up David, who did, who did Satan raise up? Goliath. But the angels did not know. And, and I don't know about you, but I wanted to shout. They desired. They desired to look and see what is going on. What is going on? What is happening? That the salvation that the prophets have searched carefully about. They've prophesied about, you know, all of that's been revealed even to the prophets, but not just for them, but so that we, but to us they were ministering the things which had not been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you, but until the Holy Spirit was sent to heaven. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the cross. Because Satan tried, but he could not stop the redemption plan. He tried to, to kill Jesus as a young child. And the Lord would, God wouldn't let him. Wouldn't let him. He tried to use Judas to betray him, to have him killed. He couldn't do it. And that's why the scripture to me, when it's so important when he said, if Satan would have known. He would not have crucified But that would have not have stopped it, even if Satan had known, because nothing stops God's plan. God's plan of redemption was fulfilled through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But even your angelic, the angelic beings were like, what is it, God, about your people? Why do you love them so much? What's, what's going on? What's... And now they're learning about the redemption plan. And they're learning more about the love of God through you and I, the church. Because they're seeing that, that Jesus willingly laid down his life for the church, for you and I. And as we reciprocate the love back to him, they're, they're finding out this mystery as it unfolds even before them. Jesus says that has happened. Says the church is falling. They themselves don't know what they need to 
do to protect us. Well, I'm sure they seek the love of God has for us. I think yes. you know what? I always thank So we end it with this quote. People of integrity and honesty not only practice what they preach, they are what they preach. Amen? Amen. All right. And next week, uh, we will continue on. We're also uh, going to start going into situations, how we can, the spiritual warfare, how we can, you know, possibly uh, tackle situations that might be before us with the Word of God and spiritual warfare and things like that. We're going to start doing that in the next uh, few weeks coming up.